Thank you for tuning in today and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, Zain Raza. Before I start this interview, I would like to remind you that we recently started our crowdfunding campaign with the goal of reaching 20,000 euros so that we can continue with our independent and non-profit journalism in 2024. Journalism that is viewer funded and does not take any money from corporations or governments. If we reach our target until the 10th of January, we will be able to cover all of our costs associated with our journalism that include, for example, tax advising, website maintenance, production, post-production, voice synchronization, video editing, and many others. So if you're watching our videos, make sure to participate today by just donating two to three dollars or euros. If all of our 145,000 subscribers just donate that amount today, we will not only be able to reach our crowdfunding target, but also be able to cover our operational costs for the next two to three years. Today, I'll be talking to independent journalist, author, and economist, Dr. Sheer Hever about Israel's war in Gaza. Dr. Sheer Hever is also the military embargo coordinator of the Boycott National Committee of the BDS movement. Sheer, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Zane. I would like to start the interview with an investigative article titled, quote, A Mass Assassination Factory Inside Israel's Calculated Bombing of Gaza, unquote, which was written by an independent, non-profit online magazine called 972 Magazine, which is run by a group of Palestinian and Israeli journalists. In the article, described the use of artificial intelligence that the Israel military is employing in its war in Gaza. Can you first tell us about the sources that the authors of this article use and then give us some details about the information it reveals? 972 Magazine is one of the very few media channels that are still able to report uh, in a, a journalistic way about what is happening, about the genocide, about the mass killing in Gaza. Yuval Avraham, the author of this uh, report, uh, is a very uh, respectable journalist and uh, he's based his analysis uh, and his reporting mostly on uh, reports that he got anonymously from sources within the Israeli intelligence. And this is very important to bear in mind. First of all, it means, of course, that the report is very reliable and very believable. But we also cannot ignore the fact that the Israeli establishment, the Israeli military, the Israeli government, they are not exactly opposed to this article being published. Uh, so even though the article makes very serious uh, and justified accusations against the Israeli government and military for intentionally killing civilians, and I, I, we will get into that, I hope, uh, but it's also a kind of promotional for the way that the Israeli military is using uh, artificial intelligence as a, a, a weapon of war. This is the first time in history that artificial intelligence is employed by a military in such a scale. This is really the first time. And there is a lot that we need to learn from this in order to avoid a disaster. Talk about what you mentioned, the intentional killing of civilians, because um, as you probably know, there's this perspective in the German mainstream media as well as political establishment that Israel is doing everything possible uh, just to target terrorists uh, in Hamas and is avoiding any attacks on civilian casualties. It is following international law. So can you elaborate what this article uh, revealed? I mean, this is a perspective in, in the German media, which is completely delusional. And it's based uh, on the on, on a serious political problem in Germany that uh, politicians and, and institutions that are very pro-Israeli uh, are, are just incapable of looking at the facts on the ground because they are incapable of, of dealing with the reality. Uh, they invent the story as if Israel is being very careful. But anyone who speaks Hebrew, anyone who watches the Israeli media knows that around the clock there are calls for killing civilians. We see journalists who are, in order to have fun, fire shells, 150 mi 55 millimeter shells into Gaza without aiming, uh, just you know to show that they're part of the war effort. And this is clearly an intentional killing of civilians. When you have generals, journalists, politicians calling for intentional starvation of the population, how is that not intentional killing of civilians? So there is no question about that. But specifically, this article by Yuval Avraham is speaking about something different because uh, according to the rules of war, uh, just trying to exterminate a population, killing civilians is of course uh, the crime of genocide. It's a very serious crime against humanity. Uh, Israeli the Israeli military is trying to protect its own personnel from being charged uh, in the International Criminal Court in The Hague for uh, committing this crime. So they are trying to at least um, pay lip service to uh, saying that they're not 
un, uh, indiscriminately killing everyone in Gaza, but they are targeting specific people, which are the, the Hamas fighters. And uh, the uh, other casualties are collateral damage. A collateral damage is, of course, euphemism for killing civilians. But there is something which is the collateral damage factor. The collateral damage factor, which is explained in this article, is that for every targeted person, uh, there is a certain number of civilians, which is OK if they are killed as a collateral damage. And the Israeli military, the command, has to give orders to the soldiers what is the factor which is acceptable. So killing five civilians in order to kill one Hamas member, uh, is it to kill 100? The article says, yes, the numbers are getting to 100. Uh, and also, there is another factor here, which is what exactly counts as a, as a target, as a Hamas fighter, because if it's just a lowly uh, um, f- a foot soldier for Hamas who, who has a gun, uh, does that justify uh, destroying an entire apartment building and killing entire families in order to uh, kill that one person? Uh, so normally, of course, the, the laws of war do not permit this. There is a, a, an idea of proportionality. Proportionality means that uh, you're only allowed to kill people as collateral damage if uh, the uh, lives that would be saved because of the goal of the war uh, would uh, be so many and, and it is so urgent uh, that you are able to justify that. And here's where the art- artificial intelligence comes in, because the artificial intelligence that is used by the Israeli military is not what we think of in terms of artificial intelligence as a weapon if we watch science fiction movies like Terminator. You know, in those movies, it's the artificial intelligence which is taking weapons, guiding them directly to hit people and kill them. And there is a lot of concern that semi-autonomous weapons or fully autonomous weapons will be unleashed to kill um, people and then will not distinguish between fighters and civilians and may even turn against their own handlers and so on. And, and these are the, the common science fiction scenarios that, that we are confronted with. But let's look at the reality of what's happening on the ground right now. And what is happening in Gaza is something different. And unfortunately, this is something that even the article in 972 magazine uh, by Yuval Avaham does not cover this, which is that the way that this artificial intelligence uh, is actually operating in um, in combat is not by guiding the weapons at all. In fact, it operates in a very similar way to ChatGPT, to a language model. It, co- it co- uh, um, and maintains a conversation with the soldiers and tells the soldiers, according to our analysis of pictures, of videos, of the area which uh, has been scanned by drones, by cameras, there is a certain probability for hitting a target and a certain probability for hitting a certain number of unintended civilians and also a certain probability for hitting the Israeli hostages who are held in Gaza. And based on that information, the artificial intelligence then asks the soldier, do you approve this target? And if yes, you fire the weapon, not the artificial intelligence, the soldier fires. So the soldier is sitting there with their finger on the trigger and they're getting these uh, targets from the artificial intelligence one by one by one and in norm well war is never normal <laughs> in previous wars in previous attacks on gaza there has been about five to six targets that uh, were uh, created by the military intelligence every day so the soldiers would have to then fire at these targets using bombs using artillery shells Mo- uh, um, not so many artillery shells because they're very inaccurate. And if you have five to six targets, you want to use your smartest bomb in order to hit that particular target. Now we're talking about hundreds of targets per day. So that's also the reason that the Israeli military is using artillery, which is very cheap, and they're just carpet bombing the whole area. But from the perspective of the soldiers, they're not carpet bombing. They're getting specific targets. It, just that these targets are not produced by intelligence officers, they're produced by artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence goal here, and this is exactly how this language model operates, it doesn't operate on achieving maximum accuracy. Uh, we have no way to know if the analysis of the pictures, the facial recognition software that they're using is good or not. It could be completely false. What we know is how effective it is in convincing the soldiers to pull the trigger. So the artificial intelligence is actually manipulating the soldiers' 
of Israel's own side in order to believe that if they pull the trigger, they will not be killing hostages, they will not be uh, uh, killing more civilians than is allowed by this um, uh, collateral damage factor. And so that convinces them to keep pressing the trigger again and again and again, and effectively to carpet bomb the Gaza Strip. This is what is happening in these days now. Um, as, as we're speaking, because of, it's the holiday season, uh, and uh, this is exactly the moment that the Israeli government says, we, we have an opportunity to use more violence, and the artificial intelligence enables that. And this is something that we all have to be con very concerned about. First of all, because this is enabling genocide, and uh, there are more than 20,000 uh, uh, victims, casualties in the Gaza Strip, whom we know have been killed already, in addition to tens of thousands of injured, including many who have lost their limbs, uh, but also thousands who are trapped under the rubble. Uh, and there is no effort to try to rescue them, uh, and therefore they, they are uh, dying as well. So this is what's happening because of the way that artificial intelligence use, is used in such an industrial way. That's why the title of this article is The uh, Assassination Factory. Uh, an industrial killing of a whole population is, in fact, an act of genocide. Let's uh, look the, at Israel's war from a different uh, angle. Uh, initially, when Israel declared war on Gaza, it told all Palestinians living in the north of Gaza to flee to the south so they could focus on eliminating Hamas. After the Israeli government took control of much of the north, it expanded its operation to the south of Gaza. Beginning, beginning this week, however, the Israeli newspaper Israel Hayom reported that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made the following comments at his Likud party meeting when it came to Israel's plans for the population of Gaza. Quote, countries that are ready to absorb them and we are working on it, unquote. He further went on to state, quote, the world is already discussing the possibilities of our voluntary immigration, unquote. He also stressed that a team must be established that, quote, ensures that those who want to leave Gaza to a third country can do so. It needs to be settled. It has a strategic importance for the day after the war, unquote. Given the actions of the military and the statements expressed by the Israelis' leading officials in public, what do you think are the intended goals of Israel and Gaza? Well, first of all, let me, a word of advice. Don't uh, base your research on Israel Hayom or other uh, pro-government Israeli newspapers who have long since uh, stopped being uh, functioning as, as reliable media sources. In this particular case, I can actually confirm that Netanyahu did say those things. Uh, and it was reported also on real newspapers. So so I can, I can verify it. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, he said a lot of things. He, he also ordered um, one of his ministers to collect ideas of how to depopulate the Gaza Strip. And these ideas include um, ideas about killing the population as well as ethnically cleansing it and, and deporting the people into uh, other countries. Egypt has uh, strongly refused to accept uh, the uh, pa Palestinian refugees uh, because uh, uh, of, of various reasons, but of course we, we don't want an ethnic cleansing, we don't want Palestinians to be deported to Egypt, and it's very shameful that uh, the left party in Germany uh, made uh, um, a statement uh, trying to convince the Egyptian government to participate in the act of ethnic cleansing and opening the gates in order to um, uh, resettle the the Palestinian population in the Sinai Peninsula instead of uh, in Palestine. Now, um, your question was was about uh, what is the plan of the Israeli government, and the the, the honest answer is there is no plan uh, because the Israeli government is not functioning. There are different. Every minister has their own plan. Uh, the minister of intelligence is still working very hard to uh, promote the idea of. Uh, deporting all the Palestinians into the Sinai Peninsula, while other ministers uh, are doing other things. Danny Danon uh, has, um, is traveling to different countries. He, he just uh, visited Papua New Guinea uh, in an attempt to convince these countries to accept Palestinian refugees, so going much further than Egypt uh, to the other side of the world. But um, there are others who say uh, Gaza has to be burned to the ground. There is uh, one minister who suggested dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza. When we talk about uh, proportionality in times of war, then proportionality only works if you have a clear goal. And the Israeli government, when they're asked what is the goal of the war, they give a different answer every time. Sometimes they say the goal is to uh, rescue the hostages. 
Um, but I, I think I think their their actions on the ground prove that they have no intention of rescuing the, the hostages. Um, other times they say the the goal is to destroy Hamas, which is a, a, a fantasy. I mean, it's not going to happen, and and I think uh, everyone understands that unless they are very delusional or ba getting all the information from the Israeli media, wh where there are still journalists who continue to fantasize about uh, destroying Hamas somehow. Um, others say uh, the goal of the war is to conquer the Gaza Strip, uh, repopulate it with uh, illegal settlements, uh, and uh, or making it completely uninhabitable, making it into some kind of a desert, uh, or parking lot, as Israelis like to say. So all of these are different goals. Uh, of these goals, the only one which is really um, permit, permissible under international law is the return of the hostages. And in order to return the hostages, Israel needs to engage in a prisoner exchange um, agreement, which also would include a ceasefire. This, this is what the Israeli government refuses to do. And because they're not going in this direction, the number of civilians that they are allowed to kill in order to pursue their goals is exactly zero. And every person they kill is illegal. Let me take this conversation to the international stage. On the 12th of December, the United Nations General Assembly voted to demand an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. A clear majority that included 153 nations voted in favor of a ceasefire, while 10 voted against it and 23 abstained. The most powerful nation that voted against a ceasefire was, of course, the United States. On the 23rd of December, the United Nations Security Council finally passed a resolution on more aid for Gaza. However, after days of negotiations, the text of the resolution was essentially watered down and did not call for an immediate ceasefire and instead called for steps to be taken that create the conditions for a sustainable cessation of hostilities. How do you assess the UN developments taking place so far, in particular the role of the US? Yeah, let's, let's not use this passive language. The text was, was watered down. It, it was the US which watered it down by uh, uh, putting an ultimatum that unless the word ceasefire is removed from the text, they will veto it. Uh, so it is completely the decision of the United States against the uh, opinion of all other members of the Security Council to oppose a ceasefire uh, in order to continue the killing and continue the fighting. I have to say that it is completely irrational from the point of view of the United States. I mean, even if you try to see it from a strategic, geostrategic perspective, the United States is acting uh, in a very uh, stupid way, in a very irrational way, in a very similar way to how they acted in Vietnam uh, or in Iraq or in Afghanistan, where they uh, developed this idea that there could be a puppet government, which is completely uh, unpopular, unsupported by the population, especially by the indigenous population, uh, and just maintained, propped up with corruption and weapons, uh, and, and that this government can use force of arms in order to turn the whole region into a proxy of the United States imperial power. It failed in Vietnam, it failed in Iraq, it failed in Afghanistan, and it is failing, and it is certainly going to fail, uh, in Palestine. And this corrupt government, which is propped up by US uh, uh, bribes and, 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 and weapons, is the Israeli government. I think this is a, something that for Israelis, when they start to realize this, you, can you imagine what it feels like when they realize that they are the next Afghanistan, that Netanyahu is, is the next uh, Karzai, uh, and, and that this is, uh, um, their, their country is going into oblivion, uh, or not, not their country, their, their state is going into oblivion. Um, and uh, in that moment, people lose the ability to act rationally. And to see that the Israelis are not acting rationally, that they are calling for revenge, that they are supporting genocide in full knowledge that they are committing suicide, I mean, this would be the end of their state, is not completely surprising. It has happened so many times before. But what exactly does the US has to gain from this? Because if they lose their allies in the region and they strain their relationship with um, uh, their other allies in the region, like uh, the United Arab Emirates and Qatar, who are trying to call for a ceasefire and the U.S. keeps uh, uh, pushing them down to the point where these own regimes are being threatened by their own populations, whether it's in, especially in Jordan and Egypt, where there is uh, 
a large population which supports Palestinians and, and wants to end the genocide and are horrified by their government's complicity with uh, U.S. imperialism, uh, but also, of course, in Qatar, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Kuwait, all of these places are uh, not exactly democratic. Uh, and uh, all of these, uh, and, and this is the, the U.S. empire falling apart. And you see uh, that the, the emerging forces, like, for example, China, which is becoming more uh, powerful and more influential, uh, they have made it very clear that they support uh, Palestinian freedom, they support Palestinian statehood, and they support the Palestinian right of return of the refugees. That's a very, very actual thing right now, very important to mention the right of return right now, because let's not forget the population of Gaza, 2.3 million people, about b between 60 and 70 percent of them are refugees uh, who originally were expelled from their homes in what is now known as the state of Israel. Many of them lived in the areas where the kibbutzim were built, uh, which were attacked on October 7. Um, and uh, they want to go home and they have the right to go home. And, it, and, and now that Israel has demolished so many houses in Gaza, destroyed the infrastructure, polluted the groundwater, uh, caused such terrible destruction that, that it, it seems difficult to imagine how Gaza can be rebuilt and restored and what will happen to these people who have nowhere to sleep and it's winter time, then um, the question of, of the right of return becomes very, very relevant because they, they do have a right to return to their homes uh, in what is now Israel. Uh, many of these homes don't stand anymore, of course, Israel destroyed them, uh, built other homes and, and the populations have changed and there are more refugees today than there were in 1948. Um, but the right of return is certainly a path for um, saving and, and healing the Gaza Strip as well and re restoring it to, to the level that, uh, of, of normality that it had until 1948. And so that's something that um, that we see on the geopolitical level that China is already speaking about uh, for a realizable future, while the United States is just going again and again in the same path that has always led to disaster and catastrophe. And uh, it, it looks like its empire is is falling apart because of this. There was a major escalation in the region. On Monday, an Israeli airstrike in Damascus killed a high-ranking Iranian general named Sayyid Razi Muzafi, a longtime advisor of the Iranian paramilitary Revolutionary Guard in Syria. Iran has not taken any retaliatory action as of yet, even though it vowed to do so. In your view, do you think if Israel continues with its war on Gaza, an all-out regional war is possible, similar to 1973? Well, it's not going to be like 1973. That that one I can tell you because um, um, the, the history moves forward, and because um, we're, we're now a different kind of of geopolitical arrangement. I think it is interesting for for almost every Israeli. The the comparison with 1973 is something very very strong, especially that 1973 the the war started on October 6, and then 50 years and one day after. Uh, October 7, 2023, uh, the, uh, the, the, there was a, an attack that once again took the Israeli army completely by surprise, except that this time the Israeli army is not fighting big conventional armored divisions of um, Sy Syria and Egypt uh, backed by Soviet weapons. No, they're fighting a guerrilla organization which is uh, fighting with light weapons and still they're losing. Which, which also says, some, says a lot about how Israel has changed in those 50 years. Uh, but um, no, the, I, I think for the Israelis, the most uh, terrifying thought is, uh, is Hezbollah and Lebanon. And what would happen if uh, another front opens up? And just a couple of days ago, the Israeli media has um, published a great scoop that Biden has successfully convinced Netanyahu a couple of weeks ago not to start a new front with Lebanon, not to invade Lebanon. And this is an inversion of reality, which really teaches us a lot about the state of mental um, affairs in, in Israel right now, when they believe it's their decision if there's going to be a war with Hezbollah or not. And it's not their decision. Uh, and if a war will start, Israel will not be able to decide when it ends. Uh, and uh, because of this, yes, there is a very, very serious risk of a regional war. And I think this, re this risk is 
uh, higher in these days of the holidays than ever because the holiday uh, because in, in Israel there is a uh, talk that maybe the US uh, will change its position and no longer enable genocide and what if the US uh, will demand a ceasefire uh, in around January and if this happens then Israel doesn't have a lot of time and now uh, over the the time of, of Christmas and New Year's when international media is not really interested in Palestine they can uh, escalate the violence and we are seeing them escalating and, and bombing uh, Han Yunus very intensively and and killing a lot of people and in that moment if the fighting spreads also to the West Bank I mean there is fighting in the West Bank but uh, but we haven't seen a, a fraction of what it could be if the groups uh, the armed groups in the West Bank rise up against the Israeli occupation and what happens if the northern front uh, also escalates and again there is fighting and there are casualties and uh, Israel has been king, killing a lot of journalists on the northern front uh, a lot of journalists in, in South Lebanon uh, but again if uh, Hezbollah decides to actually use its force to attack Israel in this moment uh, taking advantage of the fact that the Israeli military is trapped in Gaza and, and uh, losing soldiers every day and the Israeli economy is falling apart then um, I guess if, if ever they wanted to do this, they will do it now. And so, yes, the, the risk of regional war is very high. And what, a, what is Iran's role in this is not completely clear. You started by mentioning Iran, and it's true that Iran has a lot to gain because uh, the, the sanctions against Iran and, and the coalition against Iran uh, is very much built on Israel. And without Israel, uh, Iran would be able to become a, an unchecked regional power. And of course they want that, but do they uh, want to, uh, to to sacrifice their own blood and money and, and resources in order to engage directly in a war like this? Or will that actually draw the US further in? Or are they content to sit aside and, and see Israel basically destroying itself by uh, acting in, in such an irresponsible way and by committing genocide? Uh, I'm sure that the Iranian government knows that every country that uh, or every people, every nation that commits genocide loses its sovereignty. It always happens. Uh, it happened in Rwanda. It happened in Yugoslavia. It happened in Germany, um, where where the the regime that enables genocide never survives. It is uh, a suicide action. So from their point of view, they could just wait. And, and see what happens. Uh, but if they do engage, then of course uh, the, the Israeli and the pro-Israeli forces in the region um, ha do not have the military strength to, to stand against them. Uh, let us look at some developments taking place in Germany in regards to the Israel-Palestine conflict. On November, the use of the slogan, from river to the sea, Palestine will be free, became a criminal offense in Germany, punishable by a prison sentence of up to three years or a hefty fine. However, the statement, between the sea and the Jordan, there will be only Israel's sovereignty, which is stated in the founding charter of the Likud party from 1977, the party which the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu currently heads, has not been criminalized by the Jerusalem government. Furthermore, starting this month, um, a written declaration of committing, uh, recognizing the right of the state of Israel to exist must be submitted in the eastern federal state of saxony anhalt in order to obtain German citizenship. Um, could you comment on these developments and their impact on civil liberties? You know, when, when we're thinking about uh, the genocide in Gaza and uh, tens of thousands of people who are being killed, the um, political insanity that's happening in Germany doesn't seem that interesting, I have to say. I mean, there is certainly um, an idea in Ger G Germany because it is so deeply traumatized uh, by the Holocaust. Uh, and um, uh, the, the guilt feelings, but also the uh, contradictions of trying to build a state um, without nationalism uh, but with nationalism because nationalism is part of the capitalistic uh, uh, array of, of building modern states and and uh, nato wants germany to be nationalistic and have a strong army and so on so for because of these contradictions a lot of Germans then look to Israeli nationalism as an alternative, as a proxy, 
instead of waving the German flag, they're waving the Israeli flag. Now, it's a situation in which um, Israel is, is um, falling apart at the seams, committing genocide itself, uh, the traumas are coming back, and um, then, of course, for Germans, this is very difficult, and they're acting in a very irrational, very self-destructive way. Um, destroying freedom of speech in Germany in a time like this is a very bad idea. I, I want to re remind uh, our viewers, especially if we have among our viewers uh, German journalists, this is something very important because uh, there are, uh, in, in the genocide in Rwanda, after uh, the, the genocide, there were uh, trials. And of course, the crime of genocide is very serious and people uh, were imprisoned for life for murder. But journalists who have committed um, the crime of, of uh, incitement to genocide were also punished, maybe not as severely, but they were also punished. And clearly Israeli journalists who are saying Palestinian civilians must be killed, Palestinians must be starved, um, that kind of, those kind of statements are criminal and they will be punished. But uh, to my horror, I also have to uh, add to this that German journalists would be facing charges as well, because uh, I see in the German media a lot of articles which um, deny the, the genocide, deny the killing of civilians, but also justify it. Uh, and in order to deny something and justify it at the same time, you need a lot of mental and journalistic flexibility. Uh, but uh, there are journalists who, who have this flexibility and they are doing that. Uh, and this is something that uh, is, uh, is, is simply criminal. And I think uh, this, this whole uh, nonsense with uh, criminalizing the, uh, the slogan from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, uh, is, I mean, it's, it's just an expression of um, loss of coherence by the, by the German authorities. But uh, what's happening in terms of, of justifying the genocide is much more serious. And here, the international law is superior to German law. I mean, even according to the German own legal system, inter crimes against international law supersede the local jurisdiction. So if in Sachsen-Anhalt, uh, they, they want to um, basically uh, incite uh, against people who, who don't recognize the state of Israel and call them anti-Semites and, and deny them the right to be uh, to become citizens. Uh, that is a serious act of discrimination for which they would uh, uh, be tried in an international court. And uh, their ability to, to use the, the local court system in order to discriminate against the German citizen uh, is not stronger than the international court. Dr. Shir Heber, independent economist and journalist and author, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Zane. And thank you for tuning in today. If you watched this video till the very end, make sure to take just a few more minutes and click on the description of this video to check out the information to our crowdfunding campaign. If we reach our target, we will be able to continue with our independent and nonprofit journalism in 2024. And if we're unable to reach, we will have to unfortunately scale back on our capacities. So if you're watching our videos regularly, make sure to participate today. Thank you for your support and generosity, and see you next time. True democracy needs an informed public. A public where individuals recognize the value of information. Information that has been put into the right context. A context that challenges our convictions. And convictions that are not dogmatic, but that we are capable of developing. If we combine these elements, we can revitalize and strengthen one of the most important pillars of our democracy, journalism, the fourth estate, to help find solutions and build bridges rather than divide and marginalize. This is our vision as an independent, non-profit media portal. To ensure that we can remain independent and stay true to our vision, we do not accept any advertising or funding from corporations or governments. Our journalism depends entirely on you, the public, to stay alive. Social change thrives on participation. Become part of the change. If each of our subscribers donates only three to five euros per month, 
then together we will be able to create a network that makes a valuable contribution to opinion making. All of these small contributions come together to create something big. Thank you.